You are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Donica. And you are going to love my guest today, Shannon Boudram. And I know that because you loved her previously when she was on our show. She is only the second person to ever be invited back for a second episode of In the Ladies' Room. Widely known as Shan Booty, which is an awesome name. She's a Thank certified you. sex educator, dating expert, and lifestyle personality. She's a YouTube star related to all things sex and relationships as the host of Makeup or Breakup, a weekly Facebook Live series. She's also the host of the full screen series, Your Perfect Date, where she serves as a coach to help individuals in need of dating advice. Where were you when I needed you seven years ago? Uh, she has been featured in numerous media outlets, including The View, MTV, Fox News, CNN, The New York Times, Forbes, and Times Magazine. But today, she really hits the big time by joining us again in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica. Now, her previous in the ladies' room appearance, if you missed it, was in episode 40, and it was called Keeping Her Awesome. And we have invited her back because she is super awesome. She's also the author of the book Laid, Young People's Experiences with Sex. Uh, in an easy access culture, I love the title, and it's a contributing writer for Freeform Network's The Bold Type series. Her work for the show also appears on Cosmopolitan.com. I almost said Cosmo. Uh, Shan lives in LA where she's a focal advocate for sex positive conversations and empowering the masses with clinical information through a lens that is youthful, knowledgeable, direct, and most importantly, non-judgmental. So speaking of non-judgmental, today we're gonna talk all about periods and how they sometimes turn into exclamation points. We're going to touch on everything from how to talk with your mom or your daughter about getting your period or period problems, when to see your doctor, uh, sex while having your period, what to do if you don't get your period, and when your period is more accurately referred to as a crime scene. With that, please welcome Shan Booty to the lady. Yay! Thank you so much for having me again. I did not know I was the second, second invitation. So this yes, is you are, hard. but but you are also a first because you are the first person who has been a guest on our podcast ever in history that we are going to announce live on air your engagement. So oh, congratulations! Wow. <laughs> That's so, so exciting. Much. I appreciate that. Very, very exciting. And we're very happy for you and wish you every happiness. So when's the wedding? You know what? We're going to try for December. Um, it's bizarre because I used to be a wedding photographer uh, for a I long know. time. I went to school for journalism and then my book Laid came out. Um, I toured with Laid and then like everyone else was like, okay, school is done. That passion project is done. How am I going to make money? And so now that I, it's my turn to get wedding, to get married, to get wedding, um, I just feel like I just want to keep it simple. My partner is actually a bit more bigger thinking in terms of the marriage because I would have been courthouse and done. But we're going to just like get an Airbnb Christmas time because my family's from Canada so they can come to California for the warm weather and then just have the people that we care about the most show up. And also Christmas time because that means a lot of people can't come, but I can still invite them. <laughs> You know, do my due diligence. You, you know, they just, you know, they just saw that on this podcast. <laughs> you know what? That's honestly me. So I was actually or, wanting to email. Is that your way of telling me I'm not really going to be invited? <laughs> well, it's, no, you're not. It's going to be, I'm going to keep it the smallest possible. I'm trying to chop it down. I'm talking about my grandma. That's who I'm like, probably won't come and that'll be fine with me. Oh no, you got to have your grandma there. Anyway, so that's awesome. And the number one question I get about weddings as a doctor is how do I make sure I don't have my period? Oh, wow. Uh, because of course now a lot of women and a lot, talk to their doctors about, okay, how can I go on the pill so that I avoid having my period during vacation or during mm -hmm. my wedding or honeymoon? Uh, actually, one of my most embarrassing period stories, and I'm going first, but of course I'm going to ask you your most embarrassing period stories, but I actually had major spinal surgery in January of 2014. And when you're having major surgery, you have to go off the pill. So, you know, because that can increase your risk of blood clots. And guess who got a crime scene period 
the morning of her surgery. <laughs> oh my goodness. And you can't use a tampon because you're having major surgery. And I walked in there and they tell you to get all undressed. And I was just covered with blood before my surgery. So the surgeon was actually very funny. He said, you know, I'm not, ca- I'm not counting this as part of my blood loss. You know, oh, wow. When you're a surgeon, you, you take great pride in minimizing the blood lost during a major surgery. Anyway, so that was a little embarrassing, but the good news was then I didn't have my period for the whole recovery period. So that was good. So what is your most embarrassing period story? Because I know you So you, you were to- genuinely, you couldn't wear a pad, you couldn't wear a I had a pad, or- but when you have to undress uh, completely before the surgery, everything has to be sterile. So I couldn't have anything. And I was just literally, it was a crime scene. So I was in my 50s at the time, but had not yet gone through menopause. A lot of women mistakenly think about their periods as they approach menopause, that they get lighter and lighter and further and further apart till they eventually stop. But many women have the experience that I did is that in your early 50s, your periods get heavier and heavier and closer and closer until they eventually stop. So that was the heaviest your period has ever been? Yes. Oh, wow. There might've been a little stress involved in that period. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what was your most embarrassing period story? I, um, I refer to myself jokingly as BNNB, which is like basically never not bleeding. Um, <laughs> I, because I, um, I've changed birth controls pretty frequently. Be, just from changing partners, I've gone through periods of time of celibacy, so I'll be on a pill. And then I'll stop for a period of time because I'm celibate or I'm on a pill for, to treat my acne. Uh, I have had acne since I was 14 years old. I'm 33 right now. And I tried everything. I've trust me, I've cut out dairy. I've cut out sugar. I've tried black soap. I've tried olive oil soap. I've done oil cleansing. Nothing has worked for my skin like birth control. So I have been on birth control to treat my acne maybe four to five times. And I usually just stay on it for a year. Once my skin clears up, I come off of it. And so for that reason, I just feel like I'm consistently in that, you know, that period of time where you have the three months of spotting. Just out of curiosity, why do you go off the pill after a year? Why don't you just stay on it? Because I, this pill in particular is called Diane 35 and it has extreme, it has a really high risk of blood clots. Um, It's very high in estrogen. It is actually not even approved in all countries, uh, but it's okay in Canada. So it's not a pill that they suggest. It really is an acne treatment that also is birth control. So they do not suggest that you stay on this as a long-term effective control pill. I've been on like low progestin pills to try to see, but it didn't give me the same um, acne treating benefits. So that, um, and also I'm on the IUD now. So that was also again, another period of time. So there was a time that I would just go on the IUD and then I started this birth control for um, acne. And Isn't that a shame that you already had an IUD, but you needed to be on the pill for I know. acne. And I think I, what I often say is one of the worst things we ever did with the pill was call it the birth control pill. It, if we should have come up with some other jazzy name, like the female hormone regulating pill, yes, um, because we do use the pill to treat so many other conditions other than preventing pregnancy. Uh, I actually, since we're sharing, I had my tubes tied after you know I decided I was not gonna have any more children, which is a great form of contraception. But in my early 40s, I had severe uh, perimenopausal symptoms. Um, and one of the great treatments for perimenopausal symptoms, including mood swings and sleep disturbances and night sweats and uh, you're starting to get hot flashes. Um, one of the great treatments is a low dose birth control pill. So mm-hmm. I was like, are you kidding me? I had my tubes tied and now I'm back on the pill. Yes. <laughs> but it was yeah. also great for my skin. Um, and then the other treatment that we commonly use the pill for is for women who have ovarian cysts. We commonly use that. Uh, and then with women who have migraines, uh, it's interesting about how oh, I didn't know that. about 50% of women well, their migraines will be reduced in frequency or less severe if they're on the pill. However, in about 50% of women, they get worse on the pill. So, you know, unless you have your crystal ball, you don't know which women are going to be in which category. Um, but there's all kinds of other conditions uh, that also um, respond very nicely to the pill, including menstrual cramps. Right. Menstrual cramps, shorter periods, less severe. <laughs> Uh, PMS. I was. I threw a birth control party on Sunday, and 
Yeah, this is my life. What is your birth control party? party? It was in co- and why collaboration. Were you invited? I know uh, it was in collaboration with uh, Thanks Birth Control, and it's just a day. It's coming up in October that they just want to say thank you to birth control for all that you've done. And to your point, all ranging from uh, stopping pregnancy to allowing people to go to school because. Their period cramps would get so severe that time of month that they would have to check out for an entire week. Or if they were athletes, that was an entire week that they knew that their performance would be lower. So for them, birth control was an opportunity to be their best self regardless of the date. Mm-hmm. So we, in that talk, it was just so inspiring to hear how many people were using it for different reasons, um, people's relationship with their period and how they've learned to manage it with their own special tools. And I think that it's a conversation we should be having more often. I will say I wish that I was more pro menstruation. I got this T-shirt that said um, "Hello, I'm menstruating," and the girl I directly knew her. She like wanted me to wear it and be proud and post it. I just couldn't. There's just still a part of me that's not like proud to tell everyone I am on my period and it's wonderful. Um, maybe because I don't. I actually don't love my period. I never have. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what that, what is that noise? Oh, I'm not sure. Hello. Um, I don't know too many women who are proud to be having their period or excited to be having their period unless they were worried that they had been pregnant and they were right. excited. And then it's not proud, it's excited or relieved. Um, I do know that there are many women, you know, now that we have these really low dose pills, uh, one of the advantages is many women don't have a real major period at all. Uh, those periods are really like a comma, <laughs> as opposed to the crime scene periods, which are like exclamation points. But um, I know a lot of those women, especially younger women, who are really uncomfortable with that because they like having a monthly period to let to reassure them that they're not pregnant and that their birth control is working. But the other issue, especially that I wanted to bring up with you, especially if you're like having lots of consistent bleeding problems, which may also go along with being on having an IUD, is um, one of the other reasons we put women on the pill is to um, reduce their risk of anemia or having a low blood count. So have you had your blood count chest checked lately? Maybe, maybe been like a year and a half. Uh, I should probably go back again and do that because I'm an American, I mean, a Canadian living in America. I wait until I'm home to do all healthcare stuff for the obvious reasons. Yeah. But I, yeah, I definitely should. And the I'm still in my three month. I just started back on the hormonal birth control pill like two months ago. So I'm still in that spotting phase mm-hmm. of my body figuring out what exactly are we doing. And I will admit, I have not been, because I'm not taking it for birth control, I haven't been as diligent as I should be about taking it at the same time every single yeah. day. Okay. Yeah. So I brought this on myself. I take full responsibility and my body is probably doing all the right things and angry at me versus the other way around. So the other thing is anytime you change anything hormonally in your body, whether it's because you're taking an oral contraceptive or whether you have a hormonal IUD or you have it or you stop it or you have it removed, it takes your body a while to adjust. To that and what's one, been um, your favorite birth control I'm sorry what's been your favorite birth control uh, definitely having had my tubes tied <laughs> but that's not reversible so you know it depends on what point in your life you are and what stage and what phase quite honestly I feel like every different type of my of birth control that I use and you know let's be very clear about what we're talking about um, some women, when they say birth control, they use that as a euphemism for the pill. Right. When I say birth control, I'm talking about all of the different kinds of contraceptive methods. So I think any kind I used at the time was my favorite at the time. I personally have never had an IUD, but I'm a huge fan of IUDs uh, now for younger women. When I was coming of age, uh, IUDs were off the market. Um, so you, because there were problems with the original IUDs, which have been totally resolved. Um, so I missed the IUD thing, but when I was a young woman who was first using contraception, I'm pretty sure the first thing I used was a diaphragm. Um, and a diaphragm has kind of, I think, fallen out of favor a little bit, but especially now for women who want something natural and don't want to take hormones or can't take uh, oral contraceptives, it's a good option, especially, 
I can use that to segue into for period sex. Having a diaphragm is great because it contains the menstrual blood flow for the most part, if you change it right before. Um, and it gives you the contraceptive protection that you need. It does not protect against uh, STDs uh, effectively, but would provide a little more protection than you know most other forms of contraception. So let's talk about uh, period sex, because you and I have talked about that before. I know you're writing an article about that. Yes. Um, can we say who it's for? I, I would assume so. Okay, so for Teen Vogue, which is quite honestly one of my favorite publications. First of all, I am so proud of Teen Vogue for taking on edgy, political interviews and um and and topics and really asking tough questions i quite honestly have seen some tougher questions from you know lauren laduca and from you know teen vogue writers than i have in you know sort of mainstream media so props to them but they also do a great job dealing with health topics for young women so love teen vogue um, and this is a really important question because I get a lot of questions, even on my Facebook Live uh, video today, I got a question from a young woman who said, is it safe to have sex when I'm on my period? Now, of course, she didn't tell me what she meant by safe. So I, when usually when young women ask me, is it safe? What they're really asking me is, can I get pregnant if I have sex when I'm having my period? And the answer is yes. If you look at a boy, you could get pregnant. <laughs> Right. There's been a case study for every single possible reason and method out there. That may just have been one unlucky individual versus right. the common. So, you know, what, what we tell women is it's very unlikely, but if you don't want to get pregnant, you should be using some kind of contraception, even when you have your period. And of course, um, the most likely days uh, for getting pregnant are the day of ovulation, the day before ovulation. And there's really like a window of like five days, but sperm can live for anywhere from three to five days uh, in the vagina. And so if you have a really short cycle, chances are possible that you could still get pregnant while you have your period. But talk to me about your views about sex when you have your period. I think that uh, in short is if you don't mind managing the extra mess, there should be no extra stress. And I think the conversation that we had was really great in Illumina uh, highlighting that, that in essence, it's just sex. You know, period sex is just sex with a little bit more mess, a little bit more lubrication and a slightly higher chance of transmitting STIs because of the fact that the cervix is open. And as you were mentioning, blood being the perfect target rich environment. And so all that means is you got to take extra care and wrapping it up and cleaning it up. But whatever you usually do, uh, whatever your usual system is for ensuring that you are healthy is what you should be doing on your period. And for a lot of people, it can be a time of heightened horniness. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's a time of decreased horniness. So you have got to literally go with the flow. You know, <laughs> your body, what it feels, if it feels like it's right for you, there's nothing wrong with partaking. I think that we've come into a time now where it's a lot less taboo and there's more of a general understanding that this is not, because I think I, even when I was growing up, the thought of it was like a no fly zone. Like don't even think about it. And not even that, like your period was just a time where you didn't do anything. You didn't go swimming. You know, you didn't go horseback riding. You didn't go to parties. Like you just had to shut yourself down. But I think now we're coming into a time where no, like live your normal life. Um, Yes, there's one extra thing to be cautious of, but other than that, it shouldn't stop you from doing the things that you enjoy. And sex is on the list of things that a lot of people enjoy. Right, and I think, uh, uh, what is that? I'm getting some kind of feedback. Uh, I think a lot of women are uh, concerned that about the mess and the awkwardness. And certainly when you have a new partner, you know, that's just one of those things that you have to kind of say, okay, how do you feel about this? Um, in my experience, men are much more cool with it than women. I think women are more uptight about it. Um, I haven't talked to any gay women about this, about what happens when both women are having their period at the same time. But I think we have to separate the issues from the mess versus the how do you feel. 
So a lot of women just don't feel that great when they're having their period, whether it's because of cramps, which by the way, sex can actually make menstrual cramps improve. I can reduce the pain of menstrual cramps. Sex can also uh, decrease the length of your bleeding because of increased uterine contractions, and it can expel the uterine contents uh, more quickly. Uh, so that's good. Many women have menstrual migraines. So menstrual migraine is you probably want to go to bed by yourself and you know just be in a quiet, dark environment. But if you have an average ordinary headache, sex can also make headache go away. I always used to laugh by this classic thing that you know people say about women in the movies and other popular media, oh, not tonight, honey, I have a headache. Actually, when you have a headache, it actually can make you feel better. Um, and then there are certain women who have very specific symptoms during their period, like breast tenderness. So if you have breast tenderness, okay, maybe you don't want your breasts to be involved in this particular activity on that particular day. Uh, so it's just navigating how do you feel and what feels good under those circumstances. And maybe there's other activities that are sexual in nature. So, yeah, and I love that. I think it's the thing is the, the article, I, I submitted it uh, last week, but I loved how we got to cover that, that there's a range of activities that you can do with the help of cervical caps, um, with the help of a tampon, you can, and as you mentioned as well too, with the help of a diaphragm, you're still able to play as per usual without having to, if the blood element of it is what is your issue. And vulva play is still a really wonderful, beautiful, awesome, and for some women, it could be an opportunity to say, hey, pay all the attention uh, to the vulva, because this is what, yeah, this is, this is what the season is right now. And finding out, finding what it is that makes you feel comfortable, I think that's a massive thing because even going back to what I was saying about there being this pseudo revolution that happened around the pride of period and the joy of periods. Um, and I, I have a few friends who run organizations, like one of my, one of my friends runs Happy Period, and it's about changing and, and thinks, which is the company that I'm working for right now, their whole mission is to re vitalize the way that women think about their period. And I don't know if I'm going to end up being one of those people who's like, yes, it's that time of month. Like I'm so proud and I'm proud of my bleeding because it's a, a sign of a woman's work. And I'm, this is amazing. I may not be there. And so maybe I'm not the person who's going to be comfortable with crime scene sex, period sex, because of the fact that the blood still does make me uncomfortable. Um, but there are activities that I can do that fit around my comfort level. So the focus is about what I'm doing, not about the mess that I'm making. Right. And I think, it, I think everybody has to ask, what is it that's making you uncomfortable? Is it the mess? Is it PMS? Is it the cramps? Is it you know, other symptoms? Um, and I think that really varies, not only for, from woman to woman, but also month to month. You know, there are very few women who have the same exact symptoms every month. Although I remember when I was younger and I used to get my period, um, and by younger, I mean until I was about 45, I would get exactly three zits every time I got my period. Um, exactly three. And, and I'm somebody, knock wood, who was always blessed with pretty good skin. So for me, three zits was a major breakout. Um, Your skin is fabulous, Donica. Oh, thank like you. Thank you. Uh, that was one thing I was always very, very lucky about. Um, but those three zits, I always felt like they were an announcement to the world. <laughs> that, it, that was like sort of my version of wearing that t-shirt. Right. Um, so let's switch topics a little bit. One of the questions we get a lot, you know, a lot of the women who listen to our podcast are moms. And a lot of them have daughters who are teens. And so one of the things we get a lot of questions about is how do I talk to my teenage daughter about her period and period problems. And you and I had talked about this one be once before and you said, oh, 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 me, I wanna talk about that. So what advice do you have for moms talking to their teenage daughters and, and flipping it also? Daughters talking to their mothers about it. I think it's the, the conversation shouldn't begin the day that you start bleeding. And I, love, I know a lot of people who that's where it began, where they saw the blood and they were like, oh my goodness. And as well too, it's a very bizarre time in a young person's life. It where should begin or should not begin? Should not begin. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, that should Way not be late. the first time that this comes up. Um, and yeah, a lot of people, it's a terrifying day because it is the fear of, oh my gosh, am I a big girl now? Am I no longer a kid? It, it is a, it's a sad day in many in many young women's eyes, especially if they haven't had a conversation leading up 
with their parent to assure them that it's wonderful and beautiful. The people that I know who have the best experience with their first period are the ones where their mom talked about it excitedly mm -hmm. before, like you're coming of age, this is gonna happen soon, this is a really beautiful part of your life. Um, this is gonna be a relationship you're gonna have and maintain for a very long time. I'm really excited for this to happen to you. I'm really excited for this new development. Almost, you know, like in, in Jewish culture where you have the bar mitzvah, it's a party, like you're coming of age, you're becoming something wonderful. And that notion around periods that it's a rite of passage and a beautiful occurrence and a celebration. So I know a friend who her and her mom went out for dinner, like in celebration. And I think most people's experiences is that they get shoved a box of pads and they're told, okay, now you're going to start wearing these. And that's sort of your, oh, now I have to start wearing this diaper. It doesn't really sound that fun. I don't really know how to feel about this. And am I in trouble? Are they disappointed in me? Am I disappointed in myself? What does this now mean? So just think about it. Like this is a big, there's a lot of changes happening at this time. And this almost hallmarks that change. And the more joyful you can make the process and excited, I always think about, you know, when we have babies, we're so excited for every new thing they can do. Like their natural development, every first step, you pull yourself up, every first word. And then as you get older into puberty, all of a sudden those changes are not positive. Mm. Your first period is point. not positive, right? Your boobs growing, you coming into your body, you wanting to start um, talking to people that you're attracted to. Those natural developments become negatives. And I think how great would it be if we can go back to that mindset of this child is coming of age, they're developing healthy along what a natural development should look like. And that's something to celebrate, not something to be afraid of. So do you remember your first period and your conversations with your mom? Yeah, I kind of loosely do. I really, it, I definitely we didn't go out for dinner. It wasn't a party. <laughs> I think it was more along the lines of here is a box of, pads this is what it's going to be maybe some technical information my mom is a nurse so it may have been some you may not have this regularly um your first period is not a sign that you're going to be monthly from now on it may just come sporadically but make sure that you from now on keep one pad in your backpack and so from that day forward i had one pad in my backpack after having my first um so it, it felt very practical i had a very practical response to it and i'm grateful for that because even then i was given the information and the tools to prepare myself but it wasn't a very emotional experience. Yeah, I kind of remember I was depressed about it because I was an athlete. Um, and in my, first of all, I wanted to be really tall. And so I must have known at that point that, you know, when you get your period, it's a sign that you're kind of fully maturing and that you don't really generally grow too much more in height after that. Um, so I was kind of depressed about that. And plus I was a swimmer, so I did, you know, I was feeling like, okay, this now was going to decrease my performance during those times. And when I was 12 and a half, uh, girls did not wear tampons um, for the most part. I very quickly learned about tampons after that, however. <laughs> and that was a thing. And so, yes, you absolutely can swim when you have your period. But I know there were lots of girls on my swim team who did stop coming to practice when they had their periods. And I thought that was ridiculous. Um, but I did also once have the totally humiliating experience, uh, actually the year after I graduated from college, so I was not that young, um, where I got out of a pool and sat on a white towel, which is such a rookie mistake. Um, <laughs> and I, did, you know, I didn't know I had my period, and I sat on this white towel, and you know, towels are very absorbent. <laughs> That's good, did anyone else see? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I just, I just remember trying to maintain my dignity and act like nothing happened. And I just stood up and wrapped the towel around me and walked as slowly and as controlled as I could into the locker room and then just kind of fell apart. Um, but uh, that was my uh, bathing suit experience. Uh, what advice would you give to mothers talking to their daughters? Aside from, the, I love your concept of celebrating this as a rite of passage. You know, of course, we think of it as, as parents as one more thing we now have to worry about. Right. Yeah, you know, I think just about every parent thinks, oh my God, now she can get pregnant if she even looks at a boy. 
Oh, 100%. I think, I mean, that's the same, you know, when a child starts walking now, and there's a joy, there's also the knowledge that I have to start childproofing every single corner in the house and that from now on, they have to be inside of a pen. But yeah. somehow in those moments, we don't push that to the forefront of our mind and allow that to be what leads our emotional response. We focus on this is a triumph for the fact that I have grown a child to this age, that I have successfully been able to rear a human being past a really vulnerable time in their life, which is uh, infant, being an infant and then to be a young child. That, that's an, I hope that parents would be proud of themselves, mm. proud of themselves for getting a, a child uh, to this point. Mm. And now that they can start having another wonderful phase of their life. But I think it's a mix of the emotional and the practical. So it has to be uh, encouraging feelings. And just like I think you naturally had those feelings of self-doubt or how it's gonna change my life, that conversation needs to be had of, here's what this actually means. You know, here's the changes you may see in your body going forward. Here's how you, you may have to make some adjustments, but let's get you prepared with all of the tools so that you feel you can handle this. Because at that time, you may be in your 30s or in your late 20s as a mom, or maybe your teens. Oh, no, you have to be at least in your, in your 20s. Um, and you've been doing this period thing for a while. So you are an expert in this area and lean into your expertise, talk about your own experience. The main reason why I talk so much about myself is one, I'm so interested. Um, <laughs> two, it's, well, you know, it's, it's the topic you know best. And yeah, that's, and I, I think that what's so great about what you do is that because you are so open about yourself is that people can learn from your experiences as well as yes. from your insights and from the things that you've learned along the way. And you have a microphone. Uh, years ago, I was working with Patty LaBelle on a menopause education. Pro Love her. She's fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. And we were doing this national tour and talking about uh, issues related to menopause. And I said to her one day, like, why do you do this? You're Patty LaBelle. You don't need to be, you know, going out talking about menopause. And she said, because God gave me a microphone. Uh, and she said also her uh, three sisters did not live to go through menopause. They all died very relatively young mm -hmm. of diseases. Uh, so she was saying she was proud of it and she wanted people to, she used to say, um, uh, well, she had this great expression, like prepare yourself, oh, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. Uh, it was really great. I almost lost it there. But that's what you're doing. You have a microphone. You have a platform. You have an audience. I think one of the things we also have to do is educate men about periods. Um, because I, I always used to say men making jokes about PMS can be harmful to their health. It increases the fracture rate in men <laughs> from women hitting them. Uh, but I thought it was very funny. One time I was about, my daughter was about five and she walked into the bathroom while I was either putting in a tampon or just finishing putting in a tampon or something. And she just said, what's this? And I think my advice to parents, uh, whenever their kids ask them any questions of any age that are potentially embarrassing or in areas that you're not comfortable with, answer the question as accurately and mm -hmm. succinctly and age appropriately as possible. And I just said to her, there's something that women get every month called a period where they have bleeding and this is what we use to stop the bleeding. And that's a perfectly good five-year-old answer. And she yes. thought about it for a second and she said, we won't tell Brian about this, okay? <laughs> Who's her brother. So she said, we'll keep this just between us. That's awesome. So even and a beautiful five, thing. she yeah. had a sense that this was something that boys shouldn't have to deal with. <laughs> right. And I think that that's, you know, um, the perfect thing is I it's difficult to start having the conversation when something happens. And if you've been having it, and a lot of times people say, well, my kid is so closed off, my kid's really uncomfortable or not very open with me. And if that is the case, because that dynamic obviously is a very difficult one to navigate, just provide materials, provide information or videos, YouTube videos that you think are helpful, and just say, here's a bunch of resources, look at them on your own. I think discernment is one of the greatest gifts we can give to mm -hmm. kids in the age of information. Yeah, the ability right. to know, because they're going to be bombarded with so much materials and they have Google on their side. So maybe they're not coming to you because they're searching, which is fine in some cases, but you actually don't know what they're going to get in return, what information they're going to be fed. So you having control over that by giving a recommended list could be really helpful. Um, and then just know your kid, what is their form? 
of taking in information. Are they a podcast listener? Are they, um, are they a reader? Are they a video watcher? And then meet them where they are. So I would say there's just no excuse not to find a way to communicate with them on their level and their comfort because it is their body. It is their time. It's not about you. It's about them. And the earlier you can start this form of communication and figuring out, okay, how do we best exchange information from child to parent, you continue to do that method. But I think, I don't, I don't really know because it's difficult to say. Um, as I got older, obviously, like in my 20s, I began That's to- so <laughs> old. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, past the age of it, like mattering, but I began to wish that my mom talked more about herself, talked more about her own personal experiences, and she didn't really. But I wonder if at the time, teenage time, I'd have been like, oh, gross, no, don't want to hear that. I don't want to think of you as a sexual person. But definitely in hindsight, I wish that she used herself as an example because it was very difficult for me to talk to my mom about the challenges I was facing sexually because it seemed like she was perfect. So I didn't think that she would be able to relate to my insecurities or my mistakes because she had done everything right and she had no problems. And that obviously was a misconception. My mom was at the same time as me going through her own problems and at my age had gone through similar things, but she never revealed that vulnerable side of herself to me. So I would encourage. So how did you, how did you make that switch? How did you make that happen? When I became a sex educator, right? Because then it started being, you know, it's be the change you wish to see in the world. Once I started talking about myself and now she was getting overshare information about me, which wasn't comfortable for her, um, it just became like, we'd be talking and then she's like, well, yeah, you know, when I was 14 years old and I had my first period, like I cried in my room for hours on end because I wondered, cause she had, she had a much younger sibling. And so there was a com competition factor for her mom's attention. And now she knew she was not going to be able to compete with this baby because she was a woman and that was the kid and she would no longer be her mom's little girl. And I felt that because as the youngest child as well too, that like there was a lot of pressure for me to stay my mom's little girl. And I felt maybe the same feelings of guilt when my period came. So those conversations just didn't happen at the time that I wish they would have, but they did happen later. So if you're watching this and you have an opportunity with a younger child, I would say, yeah, try, try it out, you know, sharing what you've gone through, even though it seems a little cringy. Um, I think that it's very valuable. Yeah. And I think it's not uh, teenage girls who need advice from their moms at different stages that you're in. Um, you know, you're going to be going and having a wedding. You know, that's going to be something you're going to want to talk to your mom about. Uh, there's going to be conversations about uh, various things about pregnancy, childbirth, if that's in your future. Um, lots of women in their 40s tell me they never had a conversation with their mother about menopause. And many of them no longer had their moms. So, you know, that's another issue, you know, thinking about all the conversations we wish we had had um, about those kinds of things. Um, I think many women are uncomfortable talking to their children or their parents about anything related to sex or private parts because we've kind of right. made it into a taboo. Of course, for younger women, when they have something wrong with their periods, especially a missed period, I think a missed period is one of those shared experiences that most women have where we can feel the other person's pain. You know, we have been like, that is a stressful thing. Whether you want to be pregnant or not, uh, when you want to be pregnant, you don't want to get your hopes up, you know, and, you know, I've had that experience too. Um, and not everybody has a classic 28 day cycle, you know, so a lot of women are having missed periods, heavy periods period problems, uh, all of these things that you know, we, we could do a better job talking about. I think the other question I get uh, very frequently from women, which always surprises me, this is one question which just still surprises me, is they say, how do I talk to my doctor about X, Y, Z? You know, so period problems. And I always wanna say, well, English would be <laughs> good. <laughs> Um, you know, but they're so concerned about it being such an embarrassing topic and almost concerned that the doctor will think there's something abnormal or weird about this. So what I try to tell women is, first of all, if you have a good doctor, 
there's just about nothing you can come up with that they haven't heard before. If you have a woman doctor, chances are she's experienced whatever you're talking about. So, yeah, I think it's sometimes a little embarrassing to bring up the topic, but I think just to say, I need to talk to you about some period problems that I've been having or some questions about my period. What tips do you give women who ask you about that? You know, how do I talk to my doctor about X, Y, Z question? Yeah, there's a lot of guidebooks online, which is really great. Uh, you can actually search and look it up and it will tell you, here are a list of questions to ask because sometimes, and I always say this as well too, with the talk, is like people say have the talk, but they don't talk about what to say. Mm -hmm. And the instructions we get for the talk are, you know, don't get pregnant and watch out for green genitals. But that's not enough of the breadth of what you really have to discuss. And so if you're someone who doesn't know how to have the talk, um, the five action steps org. So I work for the National Coalition for Sexual Health and they develop this comprehensive way of having the talk. And in addition, like, um, Oh my goodness, I'm forgetting their name right now, which is terrible. So I'm going to bypass that so that I don't even admit that I forgot their name. But there's other places that have guidebooks. So you can actually look it up of like, I'm having questions about my period. What should I ask my doctor? And more than likely, a list will come up somewhere. I actually I didn't that. know that the color, because I have a lot of brown blood. Mm -hmm. And I went to a conference once and the gynecologist was talking on the stage. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, if your blood is pinkish and um, very pale, or if you're brown as blood, there's probably a problem. Talk to your doctor. I'm like, oh, a problem with brown. I've had brown blood. Now, see, now I would say the other thing. I would say the exact opposite. That all the all the color usually means is how fast the flow is coming out. So brown blood usually just means it's coming out slower. So it's yeah. longer to oxidize. Where if it's bright red blood, which a lot of women find alarming, that just means it's fresh blood that's coming out. Clotting is also generally not a problem. All that means is it's been inside you longer before it's been expelled. Things that are, and this is a great topic actually, is how do you know when something's a problem that you need to bring to your doctor's attention? So a period that is missed, you know, is something you might want to bring to their attention, or you can get a pregnancy test if you're concerned, an over-the-counter pregnancy test, which pregnancy tests today now are so accurate that once you've missed your period by a day or two, you know, you can trust an over-the-counter pregnant urine pregnancy test. Um, questions like severe menstrual symptoms. So really bad cramps. Um, PMS. You know, PMS is something I think that goes way underdiagnosed and way undertreated. You know, if you're sobbing when you have your period, or my favorite, uh, my favorite guideline for how you know if you have PMS um, is kind of a joke. It's how do you, you know, how do you know if you have PMS? Everybody you meet has an attitude problem. Oh. <laughs> Which is like the classic sign of PMS is that you think everybody else has a problem or everybody else is on your case or everybody else is just ganging up on you or making you irritable. Um, those kinds of things. Periods that are more than um, five days, you should mention that to your doctor. If you're changing your protection every hour, that's seriously heavy and that's abnormal. If you're breaking through, a lot of women will tell me they're breaking through, leading through a tampon and a pad, call that to your doctor's attention. You know, so we wanna talk about things your doc are to talk to your doctor about are missing periods, too frequent periods, so periods that are coming sooner than every 21 days, um, or breakthrough bleeding in the middle of your cycle. Um, Think breaking through your protection, bleeding too heavily, um, or any significant PMS or cramping or uh, other kind of PMS type symptoms. So what other things with bleeding did we not touch on yet? Well, I, I think as well too, it's the range of, because I, I would consider my period to be eight days, mm -hmm. but that is probably three days of flow or like me needing to change a pad or tampon and I was talking to you about this underwear that I am working with that essentially you can wear in replacement for a pad and tampon. And there's a large percentage of my period that's like that, where it's not actually, if I pass some gas or if something happens where I move a lot, I might get some, but other than that, it's going to be like very light spotting. So what exactly should someone consider their period? So that's a good point. And, and I think it brings up another point. Um, 
every woman is going to know what's normal for her. So when you want to talk to your doctor, if there's a problem, it's when it's not normal for you. Um, in general, we say three to seven days is a normal period. So like that little bit of kind of brownish stuff at the end, we don't really count that, but that's normal for you. That's what your range is. And unless you're trying to do some kind of natural family planning, it doesn't really matter at the end. Just to remember, you could still get pregnant uh, when you're having that. So I think this issue of knowing what's normal for you and communicating that with your doctor is extremely important. Uh, because period changes can reflect, you know, other medical problems, um, especially, you know, things like endometriosis, where women have, you know, terrible, terrible uh, cramping pain. And so many of those women have been told that's just normal for you. you know, yeah. It's not. Uh, so that's something that needs to be diagnosed. I actually heard an interesting story. I went to uh, what I affectionately called the landscapers last week. Uh, you know, that's the waxing salon. And um, I made some comment about, I can't understand how, you know, women can do a complete bikini wax, you know, like wax everything and how painful that must be. I have never done that. Um, but she was saying, that, she is saying that has become much more common because there are many women who are concerned about tampons having ingredients they don't know about or not being completely organic. And so they don't want to use tampons. And in order to minimize the mess of having their period and using pads, they want to be completely waxed. Uh, and I thought that was, that was something I had not heard before. I haven't heard that either. That's a very long, it's a long math formula. Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot. It's a lot of connections. First of all, to clear up some misconceptions involved in that math formula, first of all, there are organic tampons. So if that's important to you, you can buy organic tampons. And I forgot the name of the brands, so I apologize to those companies. But I'm sure they can tweet me or Facebook me or let me know. Sustain um, is is one of them. Okay. Um, so you know that's important. Second of all. I have never heard anybody having problems from having used tampons that are not organic. Uh, so we don't know of any medical complications or connections between, but if that's important to you. There are organic tampons. And then using pads should not be getting blood all up in your, in your pubic hair, you know, maybe a little bit around the vulva, but really not. And you can take a shower. Uh, or you can just wipe yourself with a wet wipe or a washcloth if that's a problem. So I am not a huge fan of waxing everything. Um, and maybe that's reflecting my age or just my fear of pain. <laughs> I had a friend who got a full Brazilian and she described it as, I wasn't sure if I was sweating or crying, but my face was soaked. Oh, God. And I'm like, that'll never go. Thank you for that review. I will never do that to myself. But yeah. I, have, I remember the first time I ever had just a bikini line wax. I was trying to maintain my dignity and I was trying, I always use humor in those situations or try to. And I said, okay, I'm ready to confess. And I confessed to every terrorist activity that had ever been committed. And then I made an interesting comment. I said, Dick, in terms of torturing suspected terrorists like waxing would be a really good torture tactic right of course we don't endorse torture we don't advocate torture and then i said so why is it that women subject themselves to this thing which could be considered a torture tactic and then the light bulb went off the difference is consent so if this is something you want and you are consenting to and you're asking for then I guess it can't be classified as torture. Right. But I never went any further than the bikini line. Um, but the most painful waxing I ever had was um, before the aforementioned spinal surgery, I decided to get my legs waxed because I wouldn't be able to shave my legs for a while. And behind the knees. Oh. So, and I actually, I think I might've screamed. I even said to her, like, why don't you have like, a stick that we could just bite on. 
or something. But I have gotten a lot of interviews from journalists about waxing questions and whether it's safe to wax. And that's a whole, a whole nother topic. But before we wrap up, anything else about periods that we forgot to talk about? I think this, something I was inspired by what at the birth control party was women who use the cup mm-hmm. and how much they loved the cup, not just because obviously it's a little bit more thoughtless, but being able to one, have the relationship to know your cervix and to reach inside of it. And that like, cause it sometimes can feel like the, the, the tunnel of mystery So <laughs> we did for that reason. And then also to be able to monitor the color, the flow, the amount, and they started to got, they got to know their period a lot more because they had this really direct relationship with seeing exactly what was coming out and when. So I think that if this is an area for you, I'm going to try it for myself because I'm really fascinated by that as well. Um, this is an area for you that you want to get more knowledgeable on. Start with yourself. Start with getting to know your cycle inside and out. And that can be maybe a really beautiful, empowering space that connects us more to this dreaded time of month. Well, I think a lot more women are starting to use the menstrual cup because it's uh, of its environmental benefits because you know it's, it's, you buy one. Uh, it's certainly cer- very cost effective. Um, the number one thing I hear frust- uh, frustration from women who are using the menstrual cup, it, it's a little difficult to learn how to insert it. Yes. Uh, so this is where the YouTube videos are great, but I would encourage everybody to practice when you don't actually have your period. But remember, when you don't actually have your period, you don't have that additional lubrication. Uh, so that actually can help you insert it, but really give it three tries. Um, all righty. Anyway, this has been wonderful as always. I've loved talking to you about absolutely everything. I know women are going to send me lots of period questions now, and I'm going to be bombarded. But uh, we'd love to have you back anytime. We'll think of another sexy topic. And in the meantime, congratulations again on your engagement. And thank you for joining us in the ladies' room. Thank you. I will continue to look for any opportunity for us to work together and for me to call you to ask all my questions. So I appreciate you. All right. Take care. All right, bye. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.